Hello and welcome to another episode of Who Knew in the Moment, the podcast. Today, I'm honored to have Nick Kumulatsos with us. And Nick has uh, quite the entrepreneurial journey, but uh, a fascinating story. And one of the things that I think stood out to me most is um, how grounded he is. He says, you know, the three keys to happiness are sleep, physical fitness, and finding your passion. And uh, he has found multiple passions, uh, but I think, you know, it's truly led to the happiness that he has today. So Nick, thanks so much for being on today, brother. Yeah, it's an honor, man. And those things, those three things seem like so simple, right? But they're, they're so not. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Well, and how correlated they can be too, right? Right. Yeah. And- I love it. Well, it's good. So Nick, I I would be uh, a a terrible host if I didn't start off with young Nick. So you mentioned that, hey, I, my mom took me to the movies and I remember specific movies, but then there was one character that I never deviated away from. And that was Mr. Batman. So talk about as a younger kid, what about Batman stood out to you? Uh, This is, it's, it's interesting. No one's ever asked me that question. Um, I think that what struck out with from the old stories and then the movie was just the fact that, you know, as a young man, um, he kind of faced his some very early on adversity, right? Yeah. Like, you know, as far as the story goes and that, that struck me because of my own life. And then he, instead of utilizing that to just be kind of a crybaby about it, he, which I guess he did, you know, if you read the stories, he did for a little while, <laughs> right, right. Uh, which, you know, you know, you seeing your parents shot dead in front of you is, you know, you're going to go through some stuff, right? Yes, yeah, so that's uh, justified. But then he turned that into making himself just the most anti-fragile badass that you could be. Um, yeah. And he's not a superpower guy. He's just right. a dude like you and I yeah. that just applied himself to the like the 10th degree to become badass at every level, right? Yep. So to me, even at an early age, that just to me was like super inspiring that he didn't have any superpowers. You know, he had a plan to, he had a plan to neutralize every person with superpowers and he all did it through his own effort. Yeah, you that's know? good. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and people argue about like, well, he was rich and this and that. It's like, oh yeah, sure. But <laughs> right, right. it's a comic book, guys, relax. He had to be rich. <laughs> but in I love real it. life, in real life, I see like, instead of becoming the victim, yes. he became essentially the vigilante, right? Like, yeah. and he made that choice and he could always been this rich billionaire playboy whining about his parents, his mommy and daddy dying and, and just being an overall, you know, piece of garbage, but he didn't, right? He took Absolutely. matters into his own hands. And that's what I think, you know, even, even later in life as an adult, I'm like, that's the story, right? Mm-hmm. that's the that's the move not becoming a victim taking taking matters in your own hands and then even more important stuff when you and we can we can dive in this later but what he did was he worked on himself mm-hmm. first yeah so absolutely that's why that's why batman's badass i love it i love it now, in as you're growing up, a uh, sense of community at all points in your life has been a super important thing, whether it was growing up, it was military, it's now the businesses that you're developing. But your sense of community as a youngster, maybe wasn't the, uh, the best sense of community that a person yeah. would have picked. Yeah, I mean, if you're, uh, if you're a pissed off um, adolescent, you know, living in kind of a, a you know, rough you know rough neighborhood or growing up in rough neighborhoods yeah you're going to turn to a sense of community that is maybe not so healthy (laughs) and for me it was in form of you know what what you would call i guess at that time a gang yeah now i can't even take it seriously when i hear about gangs like kids being (laughs) gangs like sure bud Uh, you know I, i can't take it seriously so i have to say that but at the time you know that's what that's what they were called that's what it is and um yeah. And, and, you know, later in life, I look at it, I go, we were all, all of us. Um, and I wrote it in my book. Um, we are tribal creatures, right? Mm-hmm. Like we, we really are meant to be running in a pack and be part of a tribe. Yes. Um, and we might have, you know, some inner turmoil and fight, you know, inside the tribe, but at the end of the day, we want to be part of that tribe. And I think that's pre I think that's um, precedent even at an early age. And that's what I was with the with an absentee father 
and you know me and my brother and me being raised by a single mom i was looking to be a part of something um and, and so i found it unfortunately in in a negative area which is why it's so incredibly important right yes. to for young men and young and young women to have parents or have positive influences in their life that puts them in the right tribe because yep. that could be a colossal different on what kind of adults they turn out to be right absolutely and with that you know and i mean that kind of ties into what you're talking about with you know self-development and personal growth right is um you know if you surround yourself with people that don't have any desire to grow as humans you know you just kind of i mean you're going to gravitate towards that if you constantly find yourself with people who are evolving and wanting more, you'll also tend to find that you want that. So there's a lot of correlation there. hundred percent. You are a hundred percent. You are who you surround yourself with. Yep, absolutely. So as a young, once again, as a young individual, we have one incident and then we have two more incidents. And there's one of those that ends up making you realize, all right, like this is real. Like, never mind. Uh, I, I'm ready to change some of my like my ways. So, talk a little bit about that moment because that once again, it's the catalyst to really, you know, what what becomes Nick today. Yeah. So, you know, I was I was doing my little my, my little gangster thing, my wannabe <laughs> gangster thing. My hood and, stuff. Uh, you know, and I would get you know they pulled me out of school and, and and I would get you know thrown in cuffs and 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 uh, and then you know go to juvie for you know whatever. Um, and, and to me, that wasn't a big deal. Like, you know, I was around kids that were like, un, you know, unfortunately, like minded individuals, you know, from similar backgrounds. And, yeah. uh, you know, you do what you do. And it's, it's, it's not that big of a deal. And that happened a couple times. And, you know, if anything, it probably made me worse, because and that's a whole separate subject about kind of a snowball effect of once you've got a kid in that kind of system, they kind of stay in that system it takes something hard to kind of break them out of that process yeah and um but one of these times um and keep in mind this was the early 90s yeah um the juvie was full and uh so they had to process me and i guess it's what you're talking about is yeah. counting right is that the yep, one you're that's right to? that's right yeah yeah <laughs> so yeah they had to process me through the bay county jail in panama city and um bro <laughs> as like 11 i don't i don't even remember how old of maybe maybe 12 years old maybe 12 years old um i i was like this is not where i want to be i mean there was grown men you know what i mean there's grown yeah. men and, and i'm i'm a tw i'm 12 years old i'm like this is you know i thought i was a badass a little 12 year old badass <laughs> um i'm not yeah <laughs> and you know, so, and I didn't stay there, but it was just process. You know, you have to go through the whole processing thing where they, you know, they put you in somewhere and you do your fingerprints and all that kind of stuff. And um, yeah, I, I quickly realized that this was not the life for me. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I was kind of getting there already because I was just getting tired of getting messed with all the time. And, and, uh, but that really, that was the, the nail in the coffin for me. And, and after that, luckily, my uh, my mom got me hooked up with uh, doing, I had to do like, I don't know, it was like a year and a half of community service or something. It was something yeah. ridiculous. And she got me hooked up with this guy who was just a, uh, man, he was, what a great role model and really cared about um, making sure that kids had, I don't know, the proper, like by no means was he soft. Yeah. But he just had, he just held me accountable for being, you know, the right type of person. And, uh, and I had to put a lot of work in there. So, and that, you know, a company with going to County and seeing that side of crime, <laughs> uh, and then, you know, some positive, you know, after that, some positive in individuals coming into my life, that's really what kind of made the, the big change. That's great. That's huge. Now, one thing that's, you know, interesting, and once again, you know, you're, you're a young man, but I mean, kind of the reason that people have multiple issues or most multiple run-ins with certain things is because they go back to the same circle, right? And they say, well, you know what? I understand that happened, but this is still my tribe. Like I'm going to go back to that. 
So yeah. after this event, you know, you mentioned, Hey, I had to do the community service. So I got a, you know, good role model, but you know, it's, yeah. it's tough when it's not someone that's necessarily around you all the time, or it's not yeah. like a peer. So did you change peers at all? Or how did that work? Or yeah, were you I mean, a catalyst that, to help others change? From no, that everything way? kind of, you know, it kind of worked itself out because uh, I went in there, which is, it's just hilarious. Cause once I, you know, kind of get into my special operations time in the military, um, going through certain courses, it served me well being a former, uh, teen criminal. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, uh, one of the events that got me arrested, there was like a big, I don't know, I don't even want to call it a sting, but some sort of investigation. And a, a lot of kids got pulled in for questioning. I never got anything. I never told him anything. I like, I like stuck to my guns. I'm like my old, the old thing of like snitches get stitches. That's I, right. I rat, you know, you're the man and you're not going to get down on me. Well, anyways, apparently I was the one of the only people that acted like that. So they threw the book at me and I got all the felonies and everything. And I think everybody else got off because they were just like, this is what happened. And just sung. So after that all went down, everything kind of just crumbled. Um, yeah. And then, you know, people, you know, I got kicked out of school. Um, so I really, after that, I really didn't see much of, of them anymore. And, you know, I was getting processed through a county in juvie and um, had to do some stuff at this like sheriff's boot camp thing. And uh, yeah. And, and then I was on, I was on parole basically, or is that what it's called? Community yeah. service parole. Basically yeah. I was on parole. And uh, yeah, so I didn't really see him. That was it. Got it. It was done. Yeah. Yeah. So once again, I'm sure there's a lot of things that happen, but we're going to fast forward to we're 18 and we're like, yeah. well, you know, I, I could check out this military thing. And, uh, they, they say, uh, sir, I don't know if you've looked at your rap sheet, yeah, but your I, rap, I don't rap know sheet. if, yeah. uh, you're, you're exactly the person that we'd like to just allow into this uh, thing called the military. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, it was actually not even 18. I think it was, but it was before that. Cause okay. it took me, it took me a, like a year and a half, two years to even get in. But I went in, what, what the deal was, is I turned 16, finished uh, 10th grade, was making a stupid amount of money at, at a couple of different jobs throughout the summer. And it just, for me, it was like, there's no way that I'm going to give thousands of dollars a week up at 16 years old to go back to 11th grade and sit in a school for eight hours, Yeah, which is, is, is might be a whole nother problem with public school system, even <laughs> today. Um, but I was like, it just, it just didn't make sense. Um, and so I went and got my GED and then trucked on. But then I realized I start, I panicked uh, probably about six months to a year into this. You know, I had my own house on the beach. I was renting, um, you know, I had a car, I had multiple jobs. I was getting thousands of dollars a week making. Yeah. And, uh, and I had this epiphany of like the future. I was like, oh shit, man, this could be, I could be doing the same thing for like the next 10, 20 years. Yeah. And I was like, there's just absolutely no way, man. Like that kind of monotony for yeah. me yeah. would have destroyed me. You know, I would have, I would have self-sabotaged that in a hurry. Right. And um, so I was like, what's the most drastic thing that I can do? <laughs> I can do. And that was join the military at the time, you know? Yeah. And, uh, <clears throat> and I remember I was working through all that process. Anyways, I, I, and I went and talked to them and they were like, yeah, you're, he was all excited when I walked in. And then, and then when I, when he ran my details, he was like, there's no way kid, like you've got a GED, you've got multiple felonies. Like you're, you like, he like, you're more, more problem than it's worth. He like scram. And I was like, Oh, is that a fact? So that just, I became my mission. Like I nuked my entire life to, you know, quit my jobs, you know, got rid of my beach, you know, you know, got rid of my beach house, moved in with my grandmother, started going to college. Like, I, I was working nights at a movie theater for like minimum wage, which was in the nineties was like, I don't know, four seventy five or something. You know, Pops, something yeah. Like <laughs> nothing, you know? Um, and, uh, just trying to, you know, get by on, on nights and then going to school during the day. And, uh, yeah, man. And then, you know, it took me about a year and a half and, you know, s snuck in there. So the Marines say, all right, we'll take you, Nick. You're good yeah. to go. And we'd love to say, man, so this is just where the story takes off. But day seven of being yeah. in the Marines, nah, we, we, get a, we great, get a road, right? Back. Like, you did it, bro. You made it. Like, it's all good. It's all gravy from here. <laughs> no, fuck that. No, the <laughs> universe is like, oh, you think you're good? No, 
whammy. Yeah, I broke my wrist uh, training day seven uh, and got dropped to the MRP medical rehabilitation platoon. And, and uh, you know, and I did the same thing. I felt, you know, what was me felt sorry for myself, yeah. you know, but, it, you know, granted, it was like crazy, man. Like there was like this, I would never forget. There's this kid in the corner, like beating himself in the, in the face with a flashlight. There's kids in the bathroom trying to hang themselves. There's, there was a guy that broke his femur. So he had a cast up to his waist and he's basically in a wheelchair. And they were make, they were like messing with him, making him go get two sheets and a blanket. And I show up to all this madness. And I'm like, bro, this is not what, <laughs> this is not the break for that I signed up for. Like there's a dude beating himself. Like what is happening with this guy <laughs> anyways? But uh, you know, weathered the storm and, and utilized that time to just get really smart, recover, um, and, and, and kind of hack the system you know, of what is recruit training, um, learn as much of the, all the little silly things that they want you to learn. And, and I just used it as I could almost like cheat codes. So when I went back to, you got to imagine, right, you're 18 years old, you know, you're there, you get up to train day seven, and now you're like on a two month pause. Right. But I'm learning, every, I continue to learn everything as if, you know, all the way to the end training day, whatever, 90 or whatever, you know? So when I went back to training, I, I knew everything. Yeah. So let's and talk about play. that for a minute, because how many people, something goes in an adverse way of what they would have wanted and they get so caught up in themselves that they forget they could be learning or they could be, you know, developing in some other area opposed yeah, to your mindset where I think it's a natural, well, you know, not initially. Right. But I think it's yeah. a natural, uh, a natural response to some sort of like, you know, it's a tragedy, right. In your own yep. life. And that, and that's level, you know, one through a hundred. Right. Yep. But at, at the end of the day, it's like, Oh man, this didn't work out the way that I wanted to work out. What was me? Like I worked so hard, blah, 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 blah. You know, but I think that's where, I think that's where experience comes into play to where, you know, then it was catastrophic, right? When you're 18 right. years old, that's a huge catastrophic event. You bet. Today, if that same thing would have happened, I'd be like, ah, oh, well, you know, no big deal. We'll just figure it out and move on. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. But that's the difference between 40 versus, versus, you know, 18. 18. You bet. Um, so, so yeah, I think that the faster you can learn how to pivot your mind to where you take those kind of failures and go okay this is where we're at this is the situation how do i turn you know um lemons into lemonade essentially yeah you know what i mean and then sell that lemonade for a million dollars <laughs> yeah <laughs> absolutely mean? like absolutely. that's that's the that's the play and um but we get so caught up in our own emotions and our own failures and woe is me and this and that that we kind of we turn into like a self-licking ice cream cone Instead of just taking a minute, breathing, analyzing the situation, you know, kind of pause, reflect, and then figure out how, what are our moves from here? Yeah. You know? Yeah. So I think, you know, something that's interesting to me, and obviously I never went through the military, but you know, the number of people you hear speak about their time there or, um, you know, write books about their time in the military is what they took away from it. Right. I mean, a lot of people talk about, hey, I needed structure. And this finally gave me that idea of this is how I should be doing certain aspects. And then I was able to correlate that into my personal life. Right. Some people, it's about uh, the physical fitness side. Right. I mean, everyone's kind of got a different takeaway for you. What were one or what were one or two of the things that were most impactful for you that kind of changed, you know, just who Nick was through doing the military? Oh man, there's so many things, but uh, I mean, if, if you're going to take the big wave tops, I would think that the operational planning, and that's really stuff that happened later. And like, I got exposed to it early. Right. But then yep. really later, later in the years, when you're a little more senior and you're looking at things from a more strategic level, it's the effects on ground. Like how do you change the landscape of something to accomplish something? Mm. And I think it's the phase line approach of an operation that really gave me something that I could take for the rest of my life. Now yeah. you could talk about mental toughness and all these different things and fitness and there's all of that, right? Like that, that's a given. A lot of people talk about that. But one of the things that like, if you look at it, and the reason why I say this is because a lot of people will look at a goal and, or, you know, or like look at New Year's res resolutions. Like, this is what I want to do. And they just try to go for it. But it's yeah. like, you have no plan. Right. Yes. You know? 
So what we do, and, and this has kind of served me in business as well. And I've given, I've actually given multiple talks to like, you know, fortune 500 com companies about this exact thing. So you have this goal, say at the 90 day mark, you're going to have this goal, you know, first qu quarter one, this is where we want to be. Okay. Well, what, let, let's start there and work backwards and reverse engineer to where we are today. Yep. Because it's like climbing a mountain. If I think about climbing, you know, you know, summiting a mountain, man, there's 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 eight thousand feet between me and the summit, right? Essentially, there's a lot of there's a lot of checkpoints. There's a lot of you know harbor sites. There's a lot of little different things that you know crevasses that I might have to go to, uh, like smaller missions yep. that I might have to accomplish to get to the bigger goal. Yes. And if we're always focused on the big goal, we're losing sight of what's like we're going to stumble. Yeah. So like, let's just put one foot in front of the other. So, okay, we have our big goal and then say we let's, let's break that. If it's a 90 day goal, let's break that into months and then go, okay, if I need, if I'm, if I need to get this, where do I need to be at 60 days and what yep. needs to be accomplished? And then what needs to be accomplished at the 30 day? And I can break that even down to weight loss. Like, okay, I want right. to, I want to lose 30 pounds in 90 days. Yep. Totally doable. It's been done. I've done it. Um, well, okay, okay, it's 10 pounds a month, you know, break that down into weeks. It's 2.5 pounds a week. Well, and you break that 2.5 downs into seven days. That's like fraction of a pound. Like right. now that's doable. 30 yep. pounds sounds crazy. Right. You know, a, a quarter of a pound a day. Yeah. That's not so bad. Yeah. You know, so it's like, how that. do you take these bigger things? And, and obviously when I learned it, it was talking about battle spaces and, you know, and like how to destroy the enemy and things like that, <laughs> create white space and yeah. you know, security forces and all these different things. But it still, it still applies. Yes. The planning process still applies. And uh, so I think that's one of the biggest, one of the biggest takeaways from the military is that singular concept of planning and reaching goals and being successful at whatever you do, taking that process and putting it into place because now you actually have a workable plan. Yep. It's not like I have to eat this entire pizza today. Yes. I just need to eat a piece today. Yep. And then I, tomorrow and the next one. Yeah. I love that. And I think, you know, one of the tough things in uh, the way different business owners like market themselves is that they're so far one way or the other. It's like, oh, don't worry about a plan. Just go do it. You know, some people, you know, paralysis analysis. And then there's other people where it's like, you have to have everything meticulous. Otherwise, you know, don't even start because you're gonna waste money. It's like, well, we probably need to be somewhere in between, right? Because Absolutely. if you get so focused on every minute detail, you're going to not even take action. Um, at the same token, Absolute if you just start and you have nothing going on, it's like, well, uh, all right, <laughs> you're probably going to go through a lot of headaches that were completely avoidable if you had just like done a little bit of planning here. Yeah. So, I mean, you get your, your, your plan and you're one of the only other person that I've seen uh, say or heard say paralysis analysis um, because that is such. I talk to so many young entrepreneurs that are so afraid to just start, and they're like, they're just, and they do. They get in that analysis process. I'm like, dude, why don't you just start? Right, right. Execute, just start executing, and um, and I, I can't even tell you how many people I've talked to that I've watched after I tell them that. Like, I it's like I give them permission to just start. Yes, it starts and it starts to work. Yep. Uh, <clears throat> so yeah, you get your overall plan, but then you still have to execute. Right. Like that's the, that's the the biggest thing is just start. And I love the I love looking at you know if you look at even big companies, yeah. Look at the Simpsons. I love. Have you ever seen the meme of like what the Simpsons looked like when it started versus what it actually like season one or season yeah. two like? Like was it perfect? No, they just started. Exactly. First iPhone. Huge colossal failure. They made a billions of dollars. Yep. But they launched it so that they can make they can improve upon it to make the next one. Yep. And they still do that. Right. Nothing is ever perfect when they launch it, but they're executing, executing, executing. So even with us, like if I have a, a product, a training, a training plan, you know, it might not be a hundred percent, it might be at an 80%, but we're gonna put it out there. And then we're going to see what happens with it. And then we're going to go, okay, take that data back. And then we're going to improve upon it. But I could all, I could sit there and go, I could not, you know, analyze this thing. Well, this isn't right. And I need to beta test this. And this isn't right. And this isn't right until and, and to, to death, right? Yep. And it'll never get launched because it's never perfect. 
exactly your plan is something that's always evolving and always you know you're always improving upon but if you're afraid to just start oh man you're never gonna you're never gonna start just freaking start <laughs> yes love it so everyone rewind that about two minutes and no matter what it is in your life that you're thinking about starting i want you to listen to that just put it on loop for a little bit and uh and that'll help you get started that's good yeah if you're the guy it's like oh, i was i want to start a podcast start the podcast it's called anchor just download it start start talking on your phone yep. um you want to write a book write a book KDP, uh, Amazon has, you know, templates to download, you upload it, boom, you're a published author. I mean, it's like, everything is so simple, but people get so scared of, you know, whatever, just freaking start, man. Just do I it. I love it. I love it. So as you're in the military, um, in the Marines, you've got a few different places that you are serving over the course of your time there. Uh, one of them, you end up saying, you know, I had this uh, original mindset before Batman that I wanted to be Rambo. And then I actually turned into like real life Rambo and, you know, got to do that type of stuff. So talk a little bit about, you know, uh, the learning curve that goes into, you know, that part of the Marines and uh, just, you know, the camaraderie and, you know, the hell of going through all that. Yeah, I think that um, I just did like an Instagram. People were asking about that. What was harder, this or that? Yeah. And that's such a, a, an impossible question. So talking about my time in the Marine Corps, just so for, for those of you who don't know me, I, I joined the Marine Corps, got hurt, of course, and then, and then um, ended up in a, in a, a non combat MOS, um, realized quickly that this was not for me, <laughs> then took, you know, went on a deployment, did some security stuff, and then, um, and then came back and uh, took uh, screening for force recon, spent my time in recon, and then, you know, recon or force recon turned into MARSOC, and I spent my last half of my career with uh, Marine Special Operations Command. So a lot of people go like, what was harder, this or this, like, mm -hmm. say, recon or, you know, selection or whatever. And the thing is, is as you age, and as you go through something, when you're 18, recruit training is the hardest thing you've ever done right would be would recruit training be hard for me now no it would be annoying yeah, yeah, yeah. that's what it would be you know what i mean it'd right, be annoying yeah. the the physical fitness that you do in recruit training is nowhere near what i did in my later in my career right yep so so you but you but at the time it was the hardest thing because i had no experience and i had no ability or the perception of what how hard things could be right right and then the next thing would be like rip and then and then you know amphibious reconnaissance school or what, what's brc now um and then selection after that the only way to truly see what would be harder would be like you'd have to have like multiple dimensions of the same exact person at the same exact time in the same exact background yeah going yeah both of those courses simultaneously because what I thought rip was the hardest thing ever went into the next thing. And then I thought that, you know, cause it's a progressionary thing. Yep. So looking back on it, the, the, you know, like if I rewind all the way to recruit training, I'm like, that was kind of a joke Yeah. <laughs> for me, yeah, but not right. for that, not for that person. Right. Not you at that time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So when I look at young men or somebody that's saying, well, this is really hard you know, is this going to be really hard or what I need to prepare for? I'm like, well, this is probably gonna be the hardest thing you've done to date. Yep. But it won't be the hardest thing you'll ever do. Yeah. You know, like, cause, because over years you, you get tougher, you get in better shape, you get mentally more tougher, you know, and, and that's, what's great about that system is you're like, if you're, if you want, now you don't have to, you can go get some job and just kind of skate through your life and not have to really push yourself, but that's not me. Mm -hmm. So I was constantly pushing myself to the next thing. And, and, and that's, and that's a, an environment that you can for as long as you want. Yeah. Well, and you I know? think, you know, that, that visual of, you know, it's the hardest thing you've ever done. It's not the hardest thing you'll ever do. Uh, yeah. Probably served you really well in business, right? You know, I, you always think about, man, the first 10 clients that I brought on or whatever, you're like, that was so hard. Like in the moment, that was really, really hard. Right. And today right. you're like, 10 clients. I mean, give me, I don't know, three days, I'll figure it out, you know? <laughs> right, and right, so right. It, it's a very similar progression in business as what you got mm -hmm. to experience in military. Now you're like, I got to get a thousand clients. Yeah. That's, that's now that's difficult. Right. right? Yeah. yeah. 
Absolutely. And yeah, once again, it's not saying that getting 10 wasn't hard because yeah, at that time, like that was a really difficult task. Yeah. Yeah. You're learning how to speak. You're learning how to, you know, you're learning the infrastructure of how to deliver, you know, products to those 10 clients. But once you work through that, that's like, well, that's easy. I mean, I can get 10 clients a day if I really push for it. You yeah. Know? And I love the whole gun to your head. Like if you had a gun yep. to your head, can you pull it off? Yeah, yep. of course I could pull it off. But now you, like you said, you level it up and you're like, okay, now I need to get in this quarter I want to get, or this year I want a thousand clients. Yep. That's a lot harder. Yeah. You know, exactly. then you get through that and it's like, what's, what's, what's left after that. And I think that's important to understand if you can have that perception early on, Mm-hmm. I think it's freeing because now you're, now you're like, okay, yeah, this is hard. I'm going through this hard, but I'm going to get through this. And I'm going to, it, it almost gives you hope. Cause it's like, well, I will get through this. And then there's gonna be something harder than I just yeah. have to get through it. I just got to push through this and keep executing. Yeah. yeah. That's good. I love it. So military mm-hmm. time is coming to an end and you end up transitioning out of the military. And I didn't know this, but it, it sounded like a cool thing. So in the grand scheme of your life, probably not a super important thing to highlight, but I thought it was cool. So I'm gonna talk about it. Uh, you get a call from the Discovery Channel to uh, <laughs> pursue this TV opportunity. Yeah, um, which I thought was super weird. <laughs> like and, I said, uh, in the grand scheme of life, probably not a pivotal moment, but I thought it was cool. So I want to find no, out. No, it actually it turned out to be a very pivotal moment. Okay, I, I didn't know that it was going to be, but it did turn out to be one. Um, I They sent me like this, oh, man, I want to say it was like a hundred page document that I had to fill out. And I was like, and I'm trying to build a business. I'm building a nonprofit. I'm like, I don't have time for this. They're TPS reports. So my wife, my now wife filled it out for me and, uh, and we submitted it and of course got it. And, uh, and it was, a, it was another colossal failure, but what a freaking rad opportunity, man, to go yeah. on there, you know, and do this expedition. And I sliced my hand for, you know, the three people that watched that show, they saw me, they, they saw me, uh, I have no idea how many people saw it, but, um, yeah, I sliced my hand open and got medevac out of there. Um, but what was so pivotal about that experience is I fell in love with the production process. Mm-hmm. And I fell in love with telling, you know, shooting and telling a story um, and all the different parts of production. And uh, I just thought it was like the coolest thing ever. And I think this is the reason, I mean, it's not, I don't think, I know now this is the reason why my wife filled all the paperwork. She knew that I was really kind of a, a producer or content producer at heart. And that if I was exposed to it, it would kind of show that because what I was doing in my business at the time, I was like, I hated. Mm. But anytime that there was a time to like put a production together, I like my eyes got, was lit up and I was excited. And she goes, oh, I got this. And um, so that's what I was, ex- that's what I was exposed to on that show. And I came back with, even though I was like, you know, hurt and bundled up and, you know, the whole, which I, I have to tell this story. Eventually I got to launch a video with the story because I filmed everything that happened once I left the, the, for like the next like five months. Okay. And I never launched it. I've never ah. shown anybody. Um, anyways, but I fell in love with the production process so much that um, that happened in December by April of the, of the following year, I started a YouTube channel mm, and, I love that's, it. and that's where everything kind of took off. And I actually ended up going to school for uh, digital cinematography and then getting, got my master's in business entertainment. And, uh, and it was all from slicing my hand on national television. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. I love it. So to rewind, to fast forward, then you're, you're leaving the military and you, you come out and you're like, you know, I want to get into starting my own business. Talk a little bit about, you know, what was the catalyst for that? Did you have the idea while you were in the Marines that that's what you'd want to do or was oh, it? Oh, no, man, absolutely not. I, I did. Uh, I, I got out because I was burnt out and angry. And, yep. um, Which is not uncommon, right? No, not and I got out of 12 years and, and, and there's a big there's a big exodus um, at that mark. Because especially during our time, right? You got to look, you got to think I served from 2000 to 2012. Right. Almost all of that was just wartime yeah. um, or whatever they want to call it. Um, but it was basically just back and forth to Iraq and Afghanistan continuously. 
So, you know, there, there was always a mass exodus around 12, 13 years. Mm -hmm. um, and I was one, I was one of those guys. And then I did, I didn't really know what to do in my life, right? I had, I have 12 years experience as a special operator doing this thing. And I thought, well, that's my, that's my career, right? That's what I do. Yeah. So I got out and I contracted and uh, contracted for about a year and a half. And again, same thing that happened when I was like 16, 16, 17, I saw these contractors that were, you know, 10, 20 years older than me doing the same thing over and over. Yeah. Now, don't get me wrong. The money was phenomenal. But I was the same thing when I was a kid. I was yeah. making money then too. It's, it, it wasn't for me. It wasn't always about the money. It was about like, do I enjoy my life? Right. Do I enjoy what I do? Am I moving the needle? I have to be, for me, I constantly have to be improving and moving the needle. And if I'm not, then I panic. Mm, uh, yeah. This whole sedentary, like, you know, Groundhog's Day shit just is not for me. Yeah. And I saw that in the contracting world and I wanted out. Um, so right before, right before uh, that ended, um, I started my first business, not even knowing what it was going to do. Like I just started a business. Yeah. And I was like, I got a general idea and I'm just going to start figuring it out. And uh, when I, when I went, con when I finished contracting, I kind of went all in on that and uh, which turned out to be a colossal failure. Um, but, but it was asked, so after contracting started a business. And then, and just went all into it. And we did some good things. The first business was called Survival and Tactical Systems. You know, I make a joke saying about special operators, you know, when they leave the military, they all go contracting. And when they're done contracting, they start their own contracting company. And because they think that's all they can do, you know. What yeah. I mean? But through that process is what the, uh, I just started developing infrastructure and marketing. That's what led me to discovery was because, mm -hmm. you know, I learned like, well, if you have a business, you have to market it. Yep. When we got into marketing, that's when things started to kind of take off. Yeah. And it almost the marketing aspect is what did better than really the product we were selling. Interesting. So, um, and that's kind of led me, you know, if you fast forward, it's really led me what what's going on today. Um, yeah. And yeah, so that's kind of so, it. So let's talk a little bit about what's going on today. So we're uh we're uh connected with johnny slicks and yeah. johnny slicks has a great story uh you got 19 dms from a guy that's like hey dude help me out uh it was you're like, like it was like right. 97 dms <laughs> my bad I, I i reduced it too many but either way yeah. it's a lot right um, yeah so talk a little bit about that you know how that partnership came to be i mean once like yeah. you said you know obviously you're doing good things in marketing and any new company trying to get started especially in that industry because it's I mean, there's a lot of competition right now, uh, needs to be good at marketing. Yeah. So even before that, so, so after I, what I considered ST, you know, STS to be a kind of a colossal failure, it really wasn't because what happened was we developed so much infrastructure on shipping and, and being able to create, you know, print goods and make yeah. goods. And I had hired employees. And so we had this infrastructure cap capability, which led me to being able to start more companies. Yeah. So at one point we had seven businesses that were running simultaneously. Wow. And I would never recommend that to someone generally. However, at that time in my life, it was like we were doing things to basically see, throw as much shit at the wall and see what stuck. Yep. And um, so like most people say, well, no, you need singular focus. Yes, I agree. That's right. a true statement because you'll get more done. But in the early stages, how do you know what your singular focus is going to be? Yep. You know, this is where the doing and the executing comes into play. And then you'll figure that out. You know what yep. I mean? So a lot of people gave me shit about that, about having too many businesses. But as things started to take off, we started narrowing things down. One of the things, um, one of the things obviously was Johnny Slicks. So he, he, he approached me, he had messaged me a bunch. Finally, I mean, the story's out there, but we, we linked up, we partnered um when i well before we partnered he drops he just wanted me i think he just wanted me to like share some stuff on the vlog or social media and like try to get him <laughs> some sales and um anyways so i tried it and i told my wife within like almost like within a couple of weeks i said this is a million dollar product this kid's sitting on a million dollar product now the branding was shit the market <laughs> like he had no market you know what i mean like but the, yeah. but the product right you know, what he had created was a million dollar product and I and I knew that and um 
so I said, Hey, listen, man, we're going to, this is what I, this is what I want to do. And he was all in, man. And he, uh, and if you guys watch the video, it's he's, he was a no for structure guy. He had, he would literally make product, um, go to the post office, buy all the stuff at the post office and then ship it. And I was like, and then we ran the numbers and I don't even think he made money. I think he was losing money by doing right. that. And, yeah. uh, anyways, so within, uh, so we got all involved, built a website. We launched it, you know, launched it on the vlog, launched it everywhere. First year we broke six figures. Second year uh, we did like 600, something like that. And then the third year we broke into the seven figure range. And now we're, now we're cooking. Now yeah. we're, now we're getting like, people are trying to send a cease and desist and trying to harm us. And, you know, that's when, you know, you've, you're doing something right. When you have to yes. have a lawyer, when you have to have a lawyer on retainer because everybody's coming after you. That's I was just you, about to say that. Yeah. That's, that's when you know you made it. Yeah. That, that's a pinnacle of success. It's like, right. If people are starting to be threatened by us, then we're yeah. doing it right. So, yeah. So there, there, there's some threat, there's some threat out there, but we don't really, I mean, we're not, we're not trying to harm anybody. Of course we're just, right. You know, we're just doing our own thing, but they, they see yeah. us as, they see us as a threat up and coming. And that's uh, right. What the interesting thing about our company is um, one it's, it's all organic grooming products. So we're very passionate about, especially what we've been, been exposed to in the military and overseas, um, trying to limit as much as that as possible. Plus I'm really big on health. You know, one of my other companies that we can talk about if, if you want, um, yeah. you know, very big on health and, and being the best version of ourselves. Um, and a lot of that has to do with, you know, our hormones and testosterone and things like that. And, uh, and, one of the things that harms that is a lot of the chemicals that we're exposing ourselves to. So Johnny's super passionate about making sure that everything is hundred percent organic American made. And uh, so we, we go down that vein. If you look at a lot of grooming products and you find out who is running those companies, you don't know. Right. You know, and what you get with Johnny slicks is us. Like yep. if you, if you look into Johnny slicks, it's, it's us. There's no, there's no invisible man behind the curtain, you know, <laughs> that's, that's you know, like that running the company. It's, it's Johnny and I and, and our wives and our, and our team. And uh, that's who's behind Johnny Slicks. Yeah. I love that. Then you've got, uh, uh, well, I don't know. I know last year was an interesting year with the gym. So I don't know if we still have the gym or if that's the, the gym. Is, uh, we yeah, we no, don't need to go all in. <laughs> no, no, we don't have to go into that. Uh, I don't need to, I don't need to trigger anybody politically, but, um, <laughs> now the gym is, is closed permanently. Um, it is closed permanently. It, we still have it for our private use and for employees yep. and everything. Plus the other business that I have, it kind of plays into as well. So, yeah. Yep. So talk about that one. Uh, I know like on the testosterone side and things like that. Yeah. You've really been, yeah. uh, you know, a uh, very, I'd say proactive advocate of that. So just talk a little bit about, you know, what you're doing yeah. there. So the agogi is, um, you know, it's, it's an idea that I had even way back when I had my first company, I was like, you know, I was very passionate about this idea that, um, you take a human being, you put them in and for kids, I call it man camp but you put them in man camp and you make them just the, the most, vi you know, vigilant and best version of themselves that they can be. Right. Yeah. Well, over the years with, you know, social media and what I was doing with myself and different things, people were asking me a lot, like, you know, what do I need to do about myself? What I do. And I learned that I had a group of men late twenties to 50 years old that had kind of lost their way. Yeah. And so what my business partner, Josh, and I did was we started coaching people to through fitness and health initially, that's the foundation, but also life skills, like building a routine that serves them. They're not, they're not just blindly following a life, like yeah, hard, making a hard line routine and getting them to lose weight and be fit and then spend time with their kids and, and have the energy to spend time with their kids and take their wife out on a date night and, and be the the version of masculinity that is true not yeah. this bullshit that that you know society is trying to tell us but what true masculinity is you know a man is a, a protector a professor um, a provider and, and he sets the example so how do we create that in, in a society and more and more i've seen that men have just 
allowed themselves to slide mm. and, and yeah. not necessarily on purpose. The, like, I think what happens is we, we get into this routine of like going to work, providing, going home, helping the wife with the kids. And we just get in this monotonous groundhog day where we're not taking care of ourselves with the excuse that, well, I can't go to the gym or I can't do these things because I'm, I, I got to provide for my family and then I can't take off an extra hour because I need to go home and be with my family. Right. Well, that, you know, that briefs well on paper, but in 10, 15 years and you're putting on five pounds, five pounds, five pounds. And now we're like, you know, 60 pounds, hundred pounds overweight. And we're, we got type two diabetes and we're, you know, we're going to die of obesity and heart disease. How are we serving our family now? Right. Now our kids are teenagers and, you know, dad's old and, you know, he can't really do much. And now we're just that, what the, the fat guy in the sidelines yelling at our kids at, at, a, at a wrestling match or a soccer game. Yeah. And we can't even run up and down the field, you know, and, and kids learn from us, from what we do, not what we say. Yep. They, we, we said we, they, they learn from watching us. Yep. So we created the agogi to, to counter that. And so what we do is we have men that come on board and they join our tribe. And we provide them with the, the yellow brick road, if you will, yeah. to get them on the path of where they want to be again, the, the best version of themselves. And we do that through fitness. We do that through nutrition. We do that through routine and building discipline and ensuring that they're hitting all the wickets in life. Yep. And man, it's amazing. I just shared yeah. a picture on my Instagram. He's a, for, a former, another a former recon Marine from like back in the seventies. He's uh, 65. I think he's 65 years old. He was he was like well over 300 pounds. He weighed in at 211. That's huge. This week, he's like six foot three. Like he's he's stoked. That's got amazing. A, 65. I got him on HRT. He's got a 29 year old girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> you look at the pictures, man. He's a stud, man. He's a stud. If you looked at him. Yeah. versus now yeah. he looks like a manly man now yeah or he looked like a fat old man right and now he's like you can just see like in his swagger and his clothes i was just got, gonna say that yeah yeah he went and got some tattoos <laughs> <laughs> i love he's, it he's a different person man he's a different person but that's the that's the program that's what we do now yeah, well, so there, I mean, there's so many things in there. And just for scope of time, I won't go into each one of them. But I mean, you know, the idea of your group, your tribe, right? I mean, if you yep. don't organically have that, if you can feed into one, right? Like, hey, the Agogi tribe, like, hey, it's a bunch of dudes that want what you want. Well, great. If I don't organically have that in my community, I mean, it's 2021. Get involved in something that's, you know, right. worldwide or nationwide. But what do those tribes do? They, they hold you accountable. Yeah. So now you're in a group of men that are all try all striving for the same thing. And when you fall off, it's like, no, now we have, this is what we're supposed to do as men is hold each other accountable. But everybody's so freaking scared of hurting somebody's feelings that we don't, but that's the problem. Right. And yeah. it's like, if you're slacking off, I go, Hey man, like you're slacking off. Yep. It's time to get back on the horse and do what you're supposed to be doing. Cause these are your responsibilities. And it's like, Oh yeah, this is the reason why I'm doing this. That's right. Yeah. I, there, there's a great phrase and uh, I'm, I'm obviously not like a poet or anything, but uh, it's, you know, what we tolerate today, we'll accept tomorrow. It'll become our normal then. And it's right. so true, right? I mean, it's kind of your example of the five pounds. If I gain five pounds, I mean, shoot, it's five pounds. That's not a big deal. Well, yeah, you tolerated that in year one, but now you're accepting it every year. <laughs> and now it's, it's just your normal, like, well, I mean, I'm going to gain it. It's just a matter right. of at what point and how am I yeah. going to gain it? So, yeah. you know, I think that's huge. But so the question that I want to kind of uh, end our time with is th this idea was presented to me and you've kind of hinted on it multiple times throughout today. So I just got to ask it directly. And some of it might be a regurgitated answer from earlier, but it'll be succinct. And uh, the phrase was blissful dissatisfaction. And so when, when I heard that, I was like, you know, that's a lot in only two words. That's a lot in only two words. But the idea was there are certain people on one end of the you know, scope that it's like, hey, I had a goal. I hit that goal and I plateaued for my life. Right. And I just continued to do that. 
There's mm-hmm. the complete opposite end of the spectrum where it's every time I hit a goal, I didn't even take a moment to celebrate because I was on to the next goal. And so, you know, I didn't even get to enjoy that because it was, oh man, well, you know, I hit a million in sales, but how am I going to do 2 million? And so when we were at 950, uh, I was already thinking about two and the million that I had originally set out to didn't even seem cool anymore because I was already on to the next thing. So for you, Nick, uh, you know, you've had so much different uh, success, you know, whether it was in, you know, military career, now with different businesses, how do you kind of balance that of, all right, I, I got to enjoy, you know, the certain accolades or accomplishments I've already had, but I'm not losing momentum for, for where I'm going. See, I, that's a, that's an interesting perception because I don't find I'm not, this is going to sound super weird and it, it, I'm not money driven. Yeah. Um, to me, you know, spending a million dollars on marketing, nah, I don't really care. Like spend it. I don't really care. You know, whether it's in my bank or spend on marketing, I, I, it doesn't, you know, spend 50,000 on marketing, spend a million dollars on a video. If we had it, I'd spend it. You know what I mean? It's, it's, I'm not money driven. I'm, I'm progress driven. Yeah. So those, but these are two different things. So like and success is success is, is a, an individual's definition for sure. Um, so I find those moments where I get the most joy is I'm, I'm more like that, which you said, where, yeah, we hit, you know, a million dollars in sales. Now I'm going to try to turn it into 4 million. I, you're right. I'm not, I'm not pause. I pause for like three seconds to celebrate and I'm on to the 4 million idea. <laughs> right. Yeah. Because that's not where I get my celebration. My celebration comes from being able to be successful yep. and then being able to take my family on a vacation yep. and not having to worry about the money. Mm-hmm. Um, watching my son do something new for the very first time. Yeah. It's those moments because in your life, right? Like your life is very, sh- your life is very short on earth. And, you know, take it from my perspective, because I feel like everything in my life now is, is, is borrowed time. Yeah. You know, the fact that I essentially escaped death from the military, right. um, like now, like everything is just a Benny. If I get to do something, this is all a Benny. So the, the, the celebrations for me don't come from necessarily business. That's just me moving the fucking needle so that I can celebrate my life. Yep. And so it's a little bit, I guess, a different way to look at it. But um, like as far as when's, when's enough money, not never, never, it's never enough money because money solves problems. The more money I have, the more money I can donate. The more money I have, the more things that I can affect, the more change yep. that I can affect, the more lives that I can, I can affect, the more that I can take, take care of my family and provide them with proper education and proper you know, housing and proper experiences. So that side of it, it's, you know, you never peak, mm-hmm. ever, you know, but my celebrations come from life, yep. like real life, yeah. real, real, um, exchanges, real moments that are just, uh, that leave an impact on you. I like it. you're going to like the business shit. Like I've forgotten, not, you know, 50 to 90% of it, you know what yep. I mean? Yeah. But those other things like watching, you know, your kid crawl for the first time, or, you know, that moment when your teenage girl needs you for something yep. because you know, teenage teenagers don't need you for anything. But when they do, it's like, man, that like, that it's a moment that sticks with you, right? Or they, yep. you know, they say something actually nice. They, they say something nice to you. Um, those are moments, th- those are moments to celebrate. Yeah. Yep. Making a million dollars. Cool. You can, you can, yeah, cool. You can lose a million dollars just as fast as you made it. Yep. You know, and that means, and those, and at the end of the day, that that, that stuff kind of means nothing. Yeah. I love, yeah. I love your answer to that. And I think, you know, one of the things that we hit, hit on earlier um, sticks out to me as well, where we talked about, you know, as you're growing, you know, the things that were seemingly difficult aren't difficult anymore, right? Right. And it's kind of similar as you progress in your business, you know, those first 10 clients, once again, it was really tough. Then now I look back, I'm like, I mean, I don't even know why I was happy that I got 10 clients. Like, I, I shouldn't have really been that happy, but I had to get to 10 before I could ever get to that's where you right? were at at the that's where you were at at that point in life, right? Yes. So you were stoked. You exactly. Know? And yeah. so I think, you know, that is the the process of as you're working towards your goal, like you have to level up and get better. Otherwise you won't get to that, you know, that thousandth client. And so as you're leveling up and getting better, 
the the reason that moment doesn't seem to be like this pinnacle moment anymore is because you're not standing at the bottom of the mountain looking up anymore. You know, you've gone through the adversity to get to that level. And now it's like, well, now I'm capable, I, th- I bet I'm probably capable of 2000. So, you know, it's like, now my mindset shifts, not because it's not cool to be at a thousand, but it's like, I've just leveled up, you know, I'm not at the beginning of the level anymore. I've gone through, you know, so many restarts and now I'm up here. So it's like, well, I better try and, you know, challenge myself to get to there. Yeah. And that's, and that's more along the lines of, of individual personal development, right? Yeah. Like that's really getting you, that has nothing to do with your life, right? That's you and your brain and your heart always n- never peaking, Yep. never settling and never peaking. Like I, the, the worst thing that I hate is like, you know, the best times, uh, you know, the best times of my life was the military. The best times of my life was college. Like, yep. dude, if that's the best times, you need to go live some. <laughs> what have you been doing? Live. Like, there's a lot of awesome shit to do, man. So like, I don't ever want to, and that's kind of like what the book's about is, you know, never being afraid to, to turn the page of that chapter and make the next chapter the very best version. Yep. You know, make the Make the next chapter the best version of your life. I love that. That's good. Well, Nick, as promised, one, you've got a fascinating story, but two, there's a lot of good nuggets along the way. And I mean, it's just cool to see the progression of you and to see some of the underlying tones that, you know, you learned as an adolescent, you learned in the Marines uh, and how it's parlayed into your business success. There's, there's you, definitely you, a life theme, right? <laughs> like, I think so. I think so. Yeah. If you didn't see it before, man. hopefully you see it after today. Yeah. Yeah. Persevere. Just keep persevering, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, no, I, I appreciate it. And, uh, you know, you just got promised me, hey, you know, three years from now, we'll do this again. And uh, I'm sure you'll have Absolutely. about eight other businesses and, uh, you know, they'll all be exponentially more successful than where they're at today as well. That's right. That's right. Awesome. Well, thanks again, Nick. All right, man. Bye.